So ladies and gentlemen, my lecture is on the Old Testament and what it says to us about rest. And I hope I know how to operate this. And this is the inaugural workshop, and to me it means a lot. As I say in the workshop, this organization, this ministry, is not a money made we can get off. It comes as a serious calling. During my last segment on this earth, and God talked to me and said, you may have just the last quarter of your life. And what do you want to do with me? And what I felt was what I've been feeling all along, is to make people enjoy life. I always ask people, when you die, how do you want to feel in your sick bed? bed? Will you say this was a life worth living? For me, I'll tell you 100%. When I'm there, you don't come and sympathize with me. I've been enjoying what I call a very fulfilling life. Full of obstacles, annoying people, Hey, people you may really pronounce, I eat them. And there are those whom you love. Once I realized life is a mixed bag, I became a happy man. Once I realized that God helped me through this mess of what we call living on earth. You begin a very meaningful life. But once you try to package God as a good God who protects me from evil, you are going to be evil the rest of your life. Except the life where it leads the good and the bad. That is what the Holy Testament teaches. So this is not a money making. Mine is to transform minds if I can share a bit of my own joy in life, how I see God, and that there is no one God fits all. You have to meet your God and shake hands. And from then on, your life becomes smooth, because that God who understands you and you understand Him is the God who will make you happy. Through this door, we've heard a lady talking about Hebron Storm, and I'm familiar with me to see her coming here and telling that God is still good. It's amazing. It's only when you accept the God as a package deal for better or for worse. So this group was my January group last year, and we went and we are wearing the V-shirts, which are the market of uh, Institute shirts. One of the problems in America is workaholism. And it has its many bad products. And America wants you to be sick, you must know that. Because they have hospitals to feed, and the beds and doctors have been paid. So we become addicted to medicines. America's dependence on medicines. Population of America, 5% of the world population. <coughs> I got them this last Wednesday when I went to a, fact, to a presentation somewhere. Population of America, 5%, consumes 75% of all the medicines the world manufactures. We consume them here in America. We are number one the consumers of medication. The USA experiments new medications on patients more than any other country. If you go to the hospital, they will only, if you go to the, to, to, for eye exam or anywhere, I've asked with glaucoma, every time try this. I said, this one is working. No, try this. Stop that one for a week. Try this. Experimentation. What I just said. Life, ladies and gentlemen, things you can control, you must know what they are. And there are things which you cannot. I went to my professor one time and said, 
why does God keep on making people born and born and born? Why does he want so many angels in Japan, in London, everywhere? That was fucking my mind. And he said, Temper, ladies, do things which you can do. When you are here, you have what to study. That's all you are doing here. You are here to study. Give us the grades. Let other things to God. Leave them to God for God to deal with. So you must know which things you can control and which things you cannot. Then I realized also that my body and my mind are not one and the same thing. You understand that clearly. The mind wants ego, they want recognition, title, Dr. Mabiko. Every egoistic thing the mind wants. And it doesn't restrict itself to common people, even the president of the United States, the ego, kicks it. But what I found is that the body is not with the mind, the two are it. intention. And what we have to do always is to negotiate. Understand this clearly. If you are still well under present, you may never be sick if you understand this point right. Don't force your body to dance to the ego of your mind. If you must force your body, you must give it a period of time and say, if we achieve this goal, I'm going to take you to McDonald's, if that is where you like to go most. Or I'll take you to Longhorn and you can have your margarita. <laughs> the body will say, okay, let's go. As long as the body knows there is a stop, after we do what we have to do, then the body will go with you and it will not cause you problems. But if you force your body against this wheel all the time, it resists, it breaks down, the immune system will not work, the breathing part won't work. Now I have been taught breathe. I didn't know that breathing was something you have to be told in, in exercising physical, except the physical. I, I had to go to physical uh, therapy because I didn't know why my shoulder was hurting and they told me it's a lot of tension on my back. We have never known that in Africa you never have tension built from your shoulder until I got hit. So, <laughs> yes, we never got that. Never, I no. So they said, breathe. So that is the, I want you to know that, that if you lose hope, which you said by knowing that I finished this work and stop. Genesis 1, verse 1, 2, 4, 8. What is the theme of the chapter? Strategy. Work. Finish your work. Rest. That is all you have to do. I'm glad that my friend Lynn, I was thinking myself as she was talking, because I'm one of those uh, pronounced, if it God knows it, serious introvert is me. I just want to be alone. I am a check him in my drink that he can come up. Do your skin and we can grow. That is me. I can preach, I can teach, but after that, I am happy when I can go back to my office and just sit and close the door. Because I try to go for therapy, but they call in my medication and they say, find someone you don't want to talk to. Oh my God, I look at them, I'm scared to death. So I said, no, I should be happy with what I am. And now I'm just happy with what I am. Like who you are, like what you do, and that's what I do. 
in the ending with the text, when you read the Bible, ladies and gentlemen, the first thing you must say, do, talk to the text, keep staring at it, and what happens next? Read the text until it talks back. If the text is not talking back to you, don't preach it. Because you know nothing about it. Until the text says, Temper, I am Lord 2, verse 52, and this is what I am about. Don't talk to people about it. Because you know nothing about it. <coughs> Are you not sure that me? We could go into the length about this. Listen carefully when it talks back because it may tell its hidden secrets. It may talk about itself, the history in the text. A text has a history. So there is a history in the text you are reading and there is a history of that text transmission. So what you are reading and what you are talking to people today is not originally what the Hebrew heard. We are talking about translations. And that's why we have so many of them. Because none is close to what the Hebrew said. That's why I was happy when another person said, I want to take your course online. So that I can read the Bible in Hebrew. Because what I read in Hebrew is what you read in English. So when you say this is the word of the Lord for the people of God, I always say lie. This is the translator's word of God for the people who enjoy translations. <laughs> that is the truth. When you come go online, go with and say how many Bibles are there, how many versions of the Bible are there today, you will be amazed. Why? Because each version is trying to represent what the Hebrew Say. And so let the text begin to talk back at you, and it will not be only what the text says. You must go to down to know what the text means now as you adapt it, what it meant then when it was spoken, and what it meant to who it was spoken to, and when it was spoken, and what was going on when this text was being spoken about. Then adapt it to your own current situation. Because the times of the Bible are not our times today. The Bible is about you, ladies and gentlemen. The whole Bible is about you. When we go on trips, we only visit in the mornings. Afternoons, you are on, on your own with the directive. Go by the Sea of Galilee and ask God, What is sea you want me to do? That is what every person in the Bible asks. And God will talk to you there. Why we are important is that the Spirit of God, where is the Spirit of God? Us. And therefore, we are more important than anything else you can think about. The body is the vehicle. This temple is what God can work with this body here. So, when you take care of your body, and this is a rich of its own, I won't spend time on it, you need to do your physical. Check up every year, seriously, as a ritual. If you have a headache you cannot explain, don't rationalize. Go to the doctor and be checked. If you have a leg which is swelling and you don't know why, don't think it will go away. Yes, it will. But first, understand whether there is something going on which is beyond you. Because some things, what? just happy. But when you go to the doctor 
and they prescribe a medication or three or five, don't throw them away. Go home. Go pull them out. When you find a medication has more hazards than the little benefit they described up there, phone your doctor and say, I'm not taking it. You have another one. They do. I told my doctor this last week, I go call him and told him I'm not taking the medicine you gave me because I googled it. It was not good for my eyes. This type of glaucoma I have and what he prescribed me, they didn't check out. These are my eyes, they are not the doctor's eyes. So I told him, my eyes won't take what you gave me. He said, you are right. If that is the case, take this one. We are back to square one. So, what American medicine does, they give you medicine which makes you sick, then you go to them that are sick, they give you the medicine to deal with the sickness which they cost you, then you go back for that. In the end, you have a jar of medication. Okay, let's finish this up. You are created in the likeness of God. You are God. Let no one tell you anything less than that you are God. I used to tweet, tease my wife before she was really mature in the gospel, in, in my theology. That you know that I am a God? She said, oh, in your mind, yes. I said, no. I am really God. Why? Because it's in Genesis chapter 1. God created human beings in the likeness of God, in the likeness of the gods who created He them. Male and female, they are gods. And He said, dominate the earth. What? So, let us create humans and animals, all of them were blessed, and everything else in the world was. And then what happened? God rested on the seventh day from everything. God, what? Rested? I thought God never gets tired. Not the God of the Bible. Jesus, if you went to Mark 6, the disciples were coming and they say, we are now forming a mega church. Everybody was listening to us and all oh, things are really going to Jesus. And he said, let us go in a boat and run away from these people. Why are we going? We want to rest a while. Read your Bibles. The people were coming. Pastor, preach. Don't worry about time. Preach. Jesus says, let's run. Let's run. Instead of going on food because they will catch us, let's take a boat and cross out. Let's leave these people alone. They will kill us. If you are a pastor and you don't hear what I am saying, you are going to die. And God has no business for you up there, up there, here. Run away from people. It doesn't mean you hate them. It means you love them. Because when you come back refreshed, you are more genuine in your friendship and love. And you don't fake it. Many pastors, I don't hope you know what I'm talking about. You try to greet them, you find they are looking at someone else. They don't have time for you. Now, I want you to look at this person that I've stopped. I need this verse in this way because it's very interesting. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished. You cannot rest until you finish the project. If you try to rest, before you finish the project, you won't have good sleep because you are thinking about the project. Always make sure the project is singular. 
My messenger told you, you cannot mark tasks and learn by the Lord. One thing at a time in that dark way, that's what my father told me, who went on only up to grade three. One thing at a time in that dark way. Then you go to issue number two. So finished, and all the host of them which they stopped there, but no, and on the seventh day God ended his work. The Bible often emphasizes what we call the climax of the text. It emphasizes that God ended his work which he had made. Now we should stop there. I think we've done enough. What would we want God? And he rested on the seventh day. I hear the emphasis here. Rested, work, done, emphasis. Work, all that is coming in one verse. And then his word rested from what way? And he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. Ah, that is enough God. We have heard it. No, you haven't heard it, but we go listen. And the God blessed the seventh day and he sanctified it the seventh day. Okay, is that enough God? No. One more. Because that in it, the seventh day, God rested from all his work which he had made. That's what we call the biblical book. And there are many whooping texts in the Bible. And those whooping texts are made to stress on one point. What is the biblical book? The biblical book sings one point which you may have missed throughout the whole chapter one and the verse is God had a project. It was creation. Everything turned chaotic. God kept working on it until it was good. If you read chapter 1, it was good, good, good. God kept on assessing. There is always an assessment that it will assess what you are doing all the time. And it pronounced whether it is good or not so good. Everything was good, but when God created animals and human beings, God said it was tov me all day. That is very interesting in Hebrew. Everything was tov, tov, tov. Tov means good. Tov, tov, tov. But when human beings were created, God said it was tov me all day. Very good. Very good. Why? Because God had created human beings in His or of Him. First, I was annoyed when people said the God would be a woman. Now I love him better. As a woman, because women are passionate. I still think of my mother more than I think of my father. And I can understand why. In the whole process of my birth, my father only played one night. My mother kept working with me all the time until I grew up. So I love my mother. I can understand that now I had to write my words, but I said, oh man, you were doing something. Yeah. I think only me and Jackie can be back in front of the church, but we are here. We are here. One of the things we say about you, ladies and gentlemen, be here. Don't take your life. On the trees we say, leave me. And what we want to do today is we want to look at ourselves as leaders. Understanding yourself as a leader is the focus for this presentation. And you may say, well, how does that relate to leadership renewal? Well, if you really look at self-care, one of the key components of self-care is self-awareness and understanding who you are, understanding your strengths, understanding your limitations. And so I hope that this is um, an interactive session. It's designed to be interactive. I don't want this to be a one-way conversation, um, although I probably could fill the time talking. <laughs> I 
I'm the youngest of six, and you know the youngest, they don't let you talk much. You know, they make all the decisions for you, and you know, and you say, well, I have an opinion too, right? But I won't, I won't make up for that lost time of talking today, okay? All right, so that's what we're here to do, to understand more about who you are as a leader. And I've brought some tools and some things that we're going to get up out of our seats and engage in some activities. And so the um, first thing I want us to do, I want us to um, do an activity. This is designed to be an icebreaker. I don't know how many of you know each other or had an opportunity to speak with each other this morning, but we want to um, engage in a little bit of conversation. Um, I want you to ask the question, you need to get a partner, and preferably someone you don't know, okay? Get a partner, and ask the question, what is personal branding, okay? And then I want you to ask the person whether or not they have a personal brand, and then I want you to ponder this question, what do you think personal branding the kingdom way is? What does that mean, right? Okay, so are we clear on our instructions? Find a partner. That means you may have to get up and move around a little bit. about us. And you may be saying that why is it important 
important to others how, or why is it important how others see me? Anybody ever thought about that? Like, why is that even important? I am who I am. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of God. You know, these are the scriptures that we quote, right? You know, um, I'm the uh, pupil of his eye or of God's eye. So why is it important why others, you know, what others think about me and how they see me? So I want you to think about this. Um, it was not, it was important even for Jesus of how others saw him and thought about him. Will we prove that? Somebody say, mm -hmm. tell me a little more about that. Well, they ask who do who do they say that I am? Ah, and you were looking at my notes. <laughs> and then he asked them, but who do you say that I am? Right, absolutely. Did everyone hear him? So, um, as leaders, if we are going to take care of ourselves, we have to have an understanding of who we are. Self awareness is critically important. And a key component of self-awareness is understanding how you show up. And so um, that Bible story, um, I believe, uh, that it's in the uh, Synoptic Gospel, Matthew 6 and 15, Mark 8, 29, and Luke 9, 20. And so Jesus asked the disciples, who do you say that I am? Who do people say that I am? So it is important of how we show up. And when we talk about personal branding from a kingdom perspective or the kingdom way, we want to show up in our authenticity of who we are, who we were created to be, and also to be ambassadors of the one that we follow, right? And so sometimes we don't quite show up that way. I love the century moment that Reverend Dr. Mathico shared with us this morning, and I'm paraphrasing, and then she said that those of an unrested soul or rested soul, right? And I'm going to paraphrase. A rested soul, a self-aware soul, or a leader who understands who they are represent the kingdom well. I'm paraphrasing. <laughs> Did I do a good job of paraphrasing that? Okay, so that's what we want to talk about today. We want to talk about motivators and behaviors that impact our personal brand and how we show up in our circles of influence. So I'm here to share with you um, a presentation that is part personal, part inspirational, part testimony, part praise. And I think it's deeply rooted in, in grace, self-reflection, who we are. in my 
my boat as the storm is just swirling around me. But within him, with him in my boat, I understand that I'm not going to sink. My boat is not going to capsize, and nothing that comes my way is going to tap, put me in the water. He's going to take me safely to the shore. Now there are only some moments in life that Jesus can be with you. And in those moments, with his provision, his sustenance, and power are overwhelming. And it is in those moments, with water in the boat and the wind crashing against it, that Jesus provides all the anchors, the people that we need to get to the shore. And so I found stability, security, and steadfastness, steadfastness in set of anchors that provided support while he navigated. About he navigated the rough waters for me. And these are the anchors that only Jesus can provide. And so I began by sharing with you what the anchors are that I found to be helpful to me as I navigated with Jesus through these rough waters. So the anchors are being emotionally, being educationally equipped, emotionally healthy, physically healthy. Professionally purposeful, relationally connected, sensible stewardship, and spiritually grounded. I found that as he took me to the shore, he brought out one thing and he brought out another. It didn't all come at the same time. Not all at the same time. So I leave you with a recap of my part inspiration, part personal testimony, part praise, and how good God is with these anchors that he has placed in my life, and these anchors that he told me to write, and so that is what I need. Because each one has played a profound influence in my life. Each one. Educationally equipped, you got to get you and I didn't mention that being educationally equipped does not always relate to a degree. It does not always relate to formal education. There are truly times when you go to training school, you learn another job, get a certificate, all of that is educationally equipped. Not always about the letters behind the name. Not always about emotionally healthy. Life can be a bowl of cherries if you make it. One of the things that I love to do is travel. And I forgot to mention that I also went on an excursion to the Holy Land with Dr. Mafika. This was during the time that he did not like me. <laughs> <laughs> when he talked to me. <laughs> but we went on a, on a, sorry, we went on a two-week trip to the Holy Land, to Egypt and to Israel. And that trip taught me more about my faith, taught me more about the scripture, because the scripture came alive. The words of the book came me, because I saw what Jesus walked in. I saw what he was buried, I saw the empty tomb, and I finally understood what the empty tomb meant. You know <laughs> Professionally purposeful, passion and patient, doing what we like to do. Never underestimate the power of loving what we do. Relationally connected, having family and friends is the foundation and the fulfillment of your life. Sensible stewardship. My mother, my brother, my dad used to always tell me that money doesn't grow trees. So being faithful with our money. Being faithful with the things that are placed under our care, with our family, our time, our treasure, our talent. And being spiritually grounded. For God is the supreme source and the supreme. 
So I got here because Jesus was in my boat. When he was in my boat, he started laying out, throwing out my anchors and my life. He is my boat. And it's been my pleasure. Supreme anger in all of our 